Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our virtual program. This is Grow Your Groceries the Lazy Way with none other than the man in overalls. We are so happy to have you all here and we're happy to see you even though we can't see all of you, but we're happy to have you here today. Um, my name is Denise Reagan. I'm the Executive Director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville, and I'm here with Damian Lamar Robinson, our Operations Manager. Hi, Damian. Hello. <laughs> and we're very pleased to have you all here today with us, and we're very pleased and very grateful to the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund, who uh, made these virtual programs possible with a grant to the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And we're very appreciative of them and thank you for their fantastic contribution. We always like to start off with a poll and uh, today is no difference. So we have a poll that we're going to ask you guys to take part in. And it's why in the world do you want to have a garden this summer? Don't you know it's hot out there? So tell us why you want to have a garden. Are you hungry? Do you just like to grow things? Do you love a good challenge? If you got a different answer, put it in the chat. We have uh, about 71% has voted at this point. We'll see if we can get close up to 100 there. And it looks like every, just about everybody has voted. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And Damien, tell us how people voted. All right, well, it looks like 52% of you said that you just like to grow things, which is pretty awesome. So growth is good. <laughs> um, if you're hungry and you want fresh vegetables, that's about 27% of you that said that. And 14% of us love a good challenge. Looking in the chat, there's also uh, one person that says they're looking for a hobby. So uh, gardening is a great new hobby. And it's always nice to try something new and fresh to uh, eliminate that stress. It's good stress therapy. Yeah. To, yeah. A healthy and safe activity during this time. So I'm going to close that out. And you may need to close it on your own screens. But before um, I can move on, I need to introduce the man of the hour, Nathan Ballantyne, the man in overalls. He and his team of farmers in overalls grow and support you to grow your groceries in beautiful, bountiful, raised bed food gardens. A gardener since age eight, Nathan started his business in 2009 amidst the Great Recession. He didn't know how to fix the economy, but he knew how to grow food, so he started supporting aspiring gardeners to ensure his community would eat well as they weathered the storm. He and his team have taught tens of thousands, helped with thousands of home gardens, contributed to countless community and school gardens, and cultivated the Florida Department of Agriculture demo garden from the ground up. Nathan dreams of a network of neighborhood-based community farming teams across the deep so, please welcome Nathan Ballantyne, and if you have questions for Nathan, please put them in the chat during the program. So if, if an idea comes to you and you want to find out, you don't have to wait. You can go ahead and put it in the chat, and then we'll queue those questions up for Nathan along the way. All right. So now we're going to go live to Nathan on his farm. So I'm going to stop sharing. And... Hopefully we will see Nathan. There he is. Hey y'all. Hey, can you hear me? We sure can. Perfect. Awesome. Hey, good evening, y'all. Um, so we're talking about growing our groceries this evening. And we've got just one hour and even just a little bit less. So we're gonna um, cruise through things um, at uh, you know, at bird's eye view. Um, but what I want to do is I want to make sure that you have good resources to look back at so that when you're, you know, um, thinking is, uh, about clarifying questions and, and things like that, you have something to refer back to. So if you, um, in a separate tab on your computer, if you look at overalls.university, if you sign in there, 
um, you, you know, you say your name, your email, whatever, then what I'll do is I'll send you, um, I won't send you, the bots will send you um, my uh, resources, specifically those ones that are relevant to what we'll be talking about tonight. So it's overalls.university. If you just, you know, www.overalls.university and go there, sign in, and then it'll send you an email that says like, do you actually want to hear from this person? Um, click that button and then all of a sudden you'll get my resources in your inbox. Uh, um, links to things like how do you pick a great garden spot, my food gardening 101 resource, my um, uh, plant guide for what you can grow in and things like that. So you'll just get all that at overalls.university. Um, and with that, um, let's just, uh, just jump into things. Um, and what I want to do first is um, we're talking about how to be a lazy gardener. And really, it's just all about getting set up right, right? That's like the lion's share of it. So it requires some upfront work, but then you get to coast, right? You get to um, uh, do things the easy way because you're not fighting nature, you're, you're working with it. Um, so the, um, the biggest mistake that I do again is folks pick a, a pretty lousy spot for their garden. Um, so if you want a good spot, what you want is you want good sunlight, you want easy water access, and you want your garden to be visible and accessible by accident. Um, so in terms of sunlight, you need at least four or five hours of direct sunlight, um, especially in the summertime. If you, if you have to air for morning or afternoon sun, then go for morning because it's just a little gentler. Your, um, your things won't dry out as much. Um, you won't have to water as much, uh, but we don't always have that choice. And the, People ask, oh, is there such thing as too much sun? And the answer is only if there's too little water. Um, and it also depends on, you know, what you're growing. But we'll, we'll talk about what, what to grow. But you need that sunlight. Um, and actually, uh, in, in the notes, in that, um, the resources that I'll email you, if you log in at overalls.university, um, there's this app. It's called Sun Surveyor. And um, it's great. You can hold it up to the, the sky and see exactly where the sun will be at different times in the day. It shows you the arc of the sun and, um, and you can even change it based on the season. So you say, well, I wanna start a garden now, but I wanna make sure that also in the winter time, my garden is also in a good spot. So you can just change the date, you know, and then look like, oh, in the winter time, the sun's gonna be way down here like this. Whereas right now it's like almost right overhead. Um, anyhow, that, um, that app is in that that resource. So you need your sun, five hours of sunlight. You want your water nearby, right? Like um, if your plan is like, well, you know, it's good. I'm going to locate my garden way in the back corner of my yard, but it's okay because I have a hundred foot hose. Well, when July and August hit and your plants are wilting, right? And they're thirsty because it's been a week or two since it rained, right? How likely are you actually to want to go out there and uncoil your hose and drag it across the yard, unkink it, right? Like maybe it has to go around the house and then it gets stuck on the gutter and then accidentally ripped off the gutter. Like nobody wants that, right? So just locate your garden. Um, um, yes, Denise. Uh, nobody wants, um, I'm doing a little tech check. Uh, Denise, should I move less? to not overwhelm the, the Wi-Fi? Is that better? Uh, I'm not sure what the um, issue is, but uh, it's just, it's a, a little bit shaky. So um, we'll just have to bear with it and see if it clears up. Okay, I will, um, I'll try to move less. <laughs> I get excited. Um, so anyhow, um, try to locate your garden near to where your water uh, availability is. And, um, and the third thing is, if you locate your garden near where you can see it every day by accident, um, best case scenario where you walk by it on your way to and from wherever you're going. Um, so in my own life, my garden is right outside my front door, right by the sidewalk. And I go on a walk almost every single morning and I walk around the block. Um, and when I do that, I walk by my garden and I see what weeds need to be pulled. And um, I very rarely 
garden as a chore. Um, so I just walk by and I see one or two weeds and I pull them up and it, and it took me about a 20 second pause. And then I just go on with my morning walk. Um, if, um, if you only see your garden, you know, or only walk by your garden that once a week when you have time to kind of go out way to the backyard, then the weeds will be bigger. And what if you go out there and instead of thinking like, oh, it's gonna be so nice, you see a bunch of weeds, sometimes you get a little overwhelmed. Um, so, uh, and partly that's just because weeds get bigger as they grow, right? So if you pick them when they're really young, it's super easy. Uh, when you, um, you know, wait, then it just gets harder and harder again. So um, the more visible, the more accessible your garden is to your daily routines, um, the better. Uh, so that's the sweet spot of a perfect spot is good sunlight, easy water access, and, um, and highly um, accessible to, um, to your life. Um, so that's a good spot. Uh, and um, there's a few little things in terms of like positioning. Like I said, if you have to choose between morning or afternoon sun, I would choose morning. And that's really just because I love the spring, the fall, winter, and spring things. And so I try to push those seasons late into um, the heat. And actually, I have a garden right now. I planted not two weeks ago, and it only gets morning sun. And it's got deep shade all afternoon from about 1 p.m. onward. And so even though it's out of season, um, I... Um, I went ahead and planted some cucumbers and we even planted some arugula, um, pushing that spring season into the summer because of that afternoon shade. Um, so that's, that's how I, I like to do it. Another thing, if you, if you think about your garden in terms of your house, or you know maybe if you're in an apartment and you have a, a front stoop and a back balcony, I would always put my plants on the south side of my house as opposed to the north side. Because the way the sun angles, it always dips a little bit to the south. So if you, if you start your garden right on the north side of your house, it's gonna be in perpetual shade almost all year long. Whereas if you're on the immediate south side of the house, then you get good sun, sun um, all year round. Um, so air to the south, air to the east of, of big um, structures. Um, but ultimately what you need is that four or five hours of direct sunlight even if it's afternoon sun, it, it'll be okay. And you need that water access and, and visibility. Um, so let's see where we go. Um, so um, I'm gonna jump over to a resource called Food Gardening 101. Um, is the above garden the best? Yeah, we're gonna talk about bed types. Um, so if you, um, if you find that Food Gardening 101 resource, um, then, um, then you can follow along with this next section. And I'm gonna talk about three ways to prepare your, um, your garden bed. Um, my inclination and the thing I do the most of are raised beds. And that's really because I'm lazy and I want, um, I want a lot from a little. Um, I, I don't wanna to have to work for my lunch. Um, so raised bed is any kind of um, bed that's built on top of the existing soil that you frame out with something typically with lumber. So um, y'all can see this frame right here behind me. This is a little raised bed frame, a two by two. Um, and most of the garden beds that I build are, um, are built out of lumber like this. It's two by 10 lumber. It's, it's um, two inches thick. It's uh, 10 inches deep. And um, and um, I build them up to four feet across. They can be however long, but never more than four feet across because that way when you stoop down and reach to the center, you can plant, tend, and harvest anything to the very center of the bed without ever having to step into it. As soon as you have to step into it because you built your bed you know, five feet across, then now you're compacting soil that you don't get to reap a uh, you know, benefit from. Um, uh, so I do a lot of these beds. Um, if you can only reach from one side, um, it's worth noting, like if you built your garden right next to a fence, then you only have it two feet because you can comfortably reach about two feet. And if you can access both sides, of course, you know, two and two, you get to four. Um, but if you can only reach from that one side, it's best if it's just a two foot bed because that way you can reach to the center or to the back of it, excuse me. 
Um, so I build raised beds and then I fill them with some really good soil. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, but um, what's wonderful about it is that you go from grass to garden in, in an hour or two. And, um, and then you're ready to plant all the same day. Um, and it's just easy. And then if you've got good soil, then you plant stuff in it and they just grow and prosper. Um, Another way to prepare your garden beds is the kind of the old traditional tilling method um, where you, you can actually go to Home Depot or whatever. If you're trying to prepare a really big like survivor garden, um, this is probably the way to, to, to go about it. You know, if you're prepping and trying to put up um, all your canned vegetables for the winter, then, um, then you go rent the tiller. And what you do is you would go and ideally you would till the, um, Well, somebody, uh, I didn't see that. Um, Denise, was, do I need to see that? No, we'll keep the questions to you later. Okay, great. Um, if, um, anyhow, so you till up this whole space, you could go to Home Depot or Lowe's and rent a tiller and till up all your grass. And then ideally what you do is you wait about a week and then you come back and you do it again. Because what'll happen is as you till it, some of the grass stays on the surface and it'll start to try to grow again. But then if you do it a second time, then usually you kind of kill off that. Um, and the second time you till is when you till in some kind of organic fertilizer or compost to enrich that soil so that then you can plant it. Um, why I don't like to till is because I'm lazy. Um, and tilling tills up weed seeds that have long been buried. Um, and when, um, when, when the soil is disturbed and exposed, they grow. That's kind of their program. Um, and I don't want to pull weeds. I want to pull the very minimum. So what I do is I never till my soil. I never turn it over um, because I don't want to stir up more seeds that then are on the surface that then start growing. Um, in, my, in my compost, there are occasionally weeds, but they're, they're just on the very surface, right? And those ones come up. And then I pull all those. And then mostly I deplete the weed bank on the surface of the soil. And every once in a while, you know, a dandelion blows in or something, but there's just not very many of them. But when you till, you cycle all those hundreds or thousands of seeds back to the surface. And then when they start growing, the methodology is, oh, well, you have weeds, you need to till. So then you stir it up again, and so then you have more weeds. And I have enough to do without doing the same work, you know, just to do it again. Um, that said, my grandmother had a, a tilled garden, and she had a beautiful garden, and she just tilled a lot. You know, she would go through and till a little bit once a week. Um, but of course she had her own tillers. Another way to, um, to get ready is um, what's called a lasagna garden. And this works really well if you've got some time. You know, if you want a garden, but you're like, you know what, it's really hot. I want to get into this garden thing, but I don't know if I'm ready going into July. So then what you can do is, is um, you stockpile all kind of organic matter. I've got a, a bag of leaves that I picked over, up over in Riverside. Um, I've got a pile of wood chips and what you could do is in a space in your, um, you know, in your yard, you could just pile it up and you want to get about a foot of organic matter of all kinds of different types, leaves, wood chips, ideally something that's kind of like more fresh and nitrogen rich. So like, um, excuse me, grass clippings or, um, uh, veggie scraps. Um, here's a weird one, hair, actually, if you go to a salon and you get their hair, um, uh, depending on what products are in their hair, of course, but hair has a lot of protein, which then is nitrogen as it breaks down. Um, but anyhow, you, you just have a bunch of um, carbon rich and nitrogen rich stuff um, in a kind of low pile, about a foot thick. And then all over the top, you put leaves and then you soak it down like a, a soaking wet sponge and then you walk away. Now you have to do it deep enough, otherwise the grass will just grow through and then what you'll have is a, like a big woody, grassy, weedy mess. You don't want that. So you pile this up, up thick enough that, so that anything that was trying to grow underneath dies out. And then all of that organic matter decomposes in place. And the worms move in and they start tilling the soil for you. And um, um, after four to six months, then what you do is you rake that top layer of leaves off throw down a little organic fertilizer and then you can plant into that. And it's a, a no-till bed in the very beginning. Um, 
Um, and you could, you could potentially do that in a raised bed frame, but most times when people are doing that, they're trying to um, conserve their, their finances. So they, they just kind of um, put it all in a, in a space and, and define it without that frame. Um, so those are three methods of bed prep. Um, and again, I, I gravitate to raised beds. Um, they cost a little bit more on the front end, um, but the um, instant gratification is just, can't be beat, it's awesome. Um, let's see. Well, Nathan, I think this is the good time to take a couple questions uh, while we're on the topic of uh, picking a site and garden types and healthy soil. Um, one of the questions came in from Debbie. Sure. She asked if the above garden was best for controlling weeds. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great option for controlling weeds because those weeds are, you effectively bury most of the weeds. Um, and, um, and if there's any weeds in your, in your soil mix that you fill your garden with, um, it's so deep that once you deplete that very top layer of, um, of weeds, then, um, then you're in really good shape. Awesome. Uh, Kay Hall's asking- I think if I froze. You did briefly, but we heard you just fine. So that's great. Um, is it necessary to plant veggies that require the same amount of water together? That's a good question. That's a that's an upper level question right there. You you've <laughs> yeah. got some experience. Um, the um, uh, you know most veggies need similar amounts of water. The exception in my life really are the melons. Um, they they really don't want to be over watered, um, and so I oftentimes will plant them by themselves or on a corner. Um, and I do use, even within a raised bed, there are little microclimates of moisture where um, like the western part of your raised bed and the southern portion of that raised bed are going to be drier than other parts. Um, so if I'm planting something like, like thyme, uh, the herb thyme, then I'll plant it on one of those, the southern or the western or that corner right in the southwest corner of the, the garden. And that way they'll dry out just a little bit more than the other things. Um, so that's how I do it rather than trying to plant in separate beds. Mm -hmm. Now on the, on the subject of beds, um, when you actually put up a raised bed, what do you put under it to avoid those weeds? Sure. I actually don't put anything under it. Um, th there are very rare exceptions, but 99% of the time when I build raised beds, I don't have a bottom in it because that's why my beds are 10 inches deep um, because that's enough soil that it just kills out and blankets what's under there. Um, now there are exceptions and an exception to that rule, um, that garden I was telling you about that I planted um, just a couple weeks ago, um, my customer had a lot of torpedo grass in her yard. Um, and so we actually removed the sod and then we put down landscape fabric um, underneath the bed to try to keep it out of there. Um, but I only do that in real extreme cases like torpedo grass. If you have um, a real bad infestation of dollar weed, um, and, and sometimes with um, uh, Bermuda grass. But um, otherwise, you know, if it's if it's just a um, by and large, most weeds and, and grasses will just die out under the, the garden bed if it's you know if it's that ten inches deep. Mm -hmm. okay, well, let's, let's take two more questions. Kay Hall asked, if you have kale that's continuing to grow sort of slowly, should you pull that kale because the growth is slowed down or you sh should you just leave them? What's your recommendation? Right now? Um, you know, it depends on how it's doing. Um, I've got kale that's kind of on its last leg um, and it's way out of season, really. Kale's prime time is like late September through about April. Um, and so um, the easy answer is just pull it. But if you have a space that has um, either good afternoon shade or you've got an um, irrigation system that's going to provide consistent water, it is conceivable that you can keep that kale alive all through the summer and then it'll just kick into high gear come fall and you'll you'll kind of be ahead because you'll you'll have an already grown plant um, 
but um, it depends on some of those things. Okay. We'll, we'll... Let's hold this, um, drips or spray irrigation question because there's going to be some watering uh, discussion that uh, Nate will do later. So maybe take one other question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think is it good to use landscape mesh on top of a raised bed to control weeds and hold moisture? Um, you know, I don't think it'll help any with with uh, moisture because it's it's porous, and so the the yeah, the air, the moisture would just evaporate through it. Um, you know, I don't use landscape fabric in my beds just because it's too much a pain. Um, for me, I deal with so few weeds. Um, honestly, in my past year of of being an urban agriculturalist, I've probably spent everywhere in town. I've probably spent two or three hours, um, maybe as many as five hours pulling weeds. Um, and that's because I, um, I set it up so that I don't have to, you know, I, my soil mix doesn't have many of them, many weeds at all. And then I plant my um, crops densely. So there's not a lot of space. Um, and then I get them early. You know, when I, when I walk around my farm, I'm constantly bending down and just kind of grabbing little weeds like that. And um, it makes me look a little bit like a, a rabbit or something hopping up and down. But um, those that bend down and pull a weed today saves me an hour of time in a month because every weed grows up and then it makes flowers and it makes, and so you go from one weed that's really easy to pull today to 10,000 weeds that are hard to pull, you know, in two months from now. Um, so if you, if you go after them early, it's really easy. That's, that's how you be lazy with the weeds, more so than fabric and, and things like that. It's just um, getting them on the front end. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more soil question. Um, this is coming from Kathy. When should she use potting mix and when should you use potting soil? There's a uh, quotation around either, which is one beneficial for vegetables and fruits or flowers? Yeah. Potting mix and potting soil, really both of those terms don't mean anything. What you need to do is look at the ingredients. Um, what those mean is that they'll do, they'll do well in a pot. That's basically what they mean. And, and it means that they're going to drain really well, which in a pot is, um, is critical, especially during the cooler months because um, pots have a way of kind of going anaerobic. Um, they'll kind of fill up with water and, um, and then your plant roots rot because it's too wet. Um, but, um, but by and large, like I would never use potting mix as the primary ingredient in a raised bed um, because it's just too fluffy, it's too porous. And so you put water on it and it just flows right through it. Um, same with the nutrition in it. Um, so you put organic fertilizer and then it rains and it just washes right through it. Um, so what you need to do is get some good compost based mix uh, for your raised bed. Um, so I've got a, a magic mix, but um, if you, um, if y'all look in my DIY raised bed resource, um, I have a knockoff raised bed mix and, and basically it's, it's three parts um, mushroom compost to one part potty mix and then something that's got good um, micronutrients like kelp. Um, so you could do like a, a pound of kelp meal, one bag of potting mix and three bags of mushroom compost, and you'd have yourself a really good mix because you need something that's going to hold on to the water and the nutrition, um, not just let it um, flow through like that potting mix. Awesome. Great. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah, I think you were getting ready to talk about um, summer loving varieties of vegetables. Perfect. And um, can I get a time check from y'all? Because I can't check my phone because I'm. We're about halfway videoing. through. Okay. Perfect. We're about 30 minutes in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, uh, the, um, the thing about summer that really is you to thrive and kind of kick back and take it easy is growing the things that love the heat. So we, we have kind of three seasons in, um, in North Florida. We have the fall winter season, we have the spring season, and now we're in the hot summer season. And, um, and so um, 
I'm going to go through those other seasons um, so that you see where those things fall. But like in the fall, you're doing your um, green leafy salads and cooking greens, things like lettuces, arugula, um, uh, kale, collards, um, chard, things like that. Also those root veggies other than potatoes, so things like beets, and turnips, um, carrots, um, and that stuff prospers in the, um, in the fall and winter when it's cool, right? Like I grew as a kid, I tried to grow carrots in the springtime and they just, they were like not tasty and they were woody um, and um, so tough. Like you could not bite through those carrots um, because they don't really like it when it's hot. They like it when it's cool. Um, so that stuff grows around the, um, the new year. And then in the spring, right as the danger of frost is gone, like late February, early March, we put in our things like tomatoes, uh, cucumbers, green beans, squash, zucchini, and those things love spring, right? They, as soon as it starts warming up, they go to town and they grow like crazy. Um, and it's early enough that the heat and the pest are, that pressure is much lower. And so they can thrive Whereas when it starts really getting hot into the middle of June, they all just start dying off, right? Like I have tomatoes that are still producing right now, but it's based on blooms and on a plant that was growing for months already. So don't try to grow your tomatoes right now. It's just it's too much pain, right? Cucumbers and squash and zucchini. You hear these stories from up north, right? Where people are like, oh my gosh, only plant one squash plant because then you'll have so many, you'll be overwhelmed, yada, yada. Well, I've never had that problem in, in Florida because squash and zucchini are so pest prone here in North Florida that especially as it gets hot, the pest numbers go up. And um, I actually spent all last week going around all over town and helping people rip out their, their squash and zucchini and down some of them. So the question then is, is what do you grow now, right? Um, if you can't grow all those other things, all those other things kind of result in headaches. Um, the, the southern standard five that you can grow are sweet potatoes, hot peppers, eggplant, okra, basil, and you can throw summer peas in there. So there's like six classic southern crops. Summer peas, things like black-eyed peas, iron clay peas, zipper cream peas, they take the heat. Basil loves the heat. I'm going to put an asterisk next to basil, but basil loves the heat. Hot peppers, eggplant, sweet potatoes, and okra. They, um, all those things, when the heat really turns on, they just come alive, and they're like, I was made for this, okay? So you plant okra in the springtime, and it just struggles along, and it grows really slow, and then finally come June, it starts to grow faster, right? I actually, at one time I planted okra March 1st and then June 1st, and by July 1st, just a month later, the stuff I planted in June was bigger than what I planted in March. Even though it was, you know, it was a quarter the age, but because it got planted when it was really hot outside, it loved life and it grew like crazy. Um, uh, sweet potatoes love the heat, and the cool thing about sweet potatoes is that you don't just have to wait for the potatoes when you dig those up in the fall. You can eat some of those leaves in the meantime, uh, like you would um, cooked spinach. Uh, you can you could steam it, or I, my favorite is like a little onions and garlic, and then throw in some chopped sweet potato greens. Delicious. I've, I've got a little plant here. Um, the other cool thing about sweet potatoes is that once you have like one, I have a sweet potato, right? And it's making slips. Um, it can be hard to find sweet potato plants, but if you have a sweet potato, you can just do the whole, the toothpick trick and stick it in the jar of water. And in a, in a week or so, you'll start getting these little sprouts like this. And then you can just pluck these off and stick them in the ground and they'll grow a sweet potato. Super cool. And once this grows, it turns into a vine that looks like this. And you'll have these all over the place. And you can cut these and strip the leaves off of them like this, and then plant that, and you've got another sweet potato plant because they grow from cutting. It's really cool. So you can have sweet potatoes all over the place. Um, so, okay, so those, let's see. Uh, my asterisk next, next to basil is, um, uh, Sweet basil 
is a pathetic plant. Um, so you can grow it at your own risk. Um, but any other kind of basil is more resilient than sweet basil. So you got Tulsi basil, African blue basil, um, you've got the opal basil, you've got Italian basil. Um, the most two resilient are Tulsi basil and African blue basil. They just, they grow like gangbusters. It's just awesome. And this, the same similar flavor profile exists in them, so you can use them like you would a you know, sweet basil. Um, but even the Italian basil and the um, opal basil, which is like a purple basil, they're even more resilient than the sweet basil. Um, for whatever reason, it really doesn't like our heat and Can humidity, so it um, it kind of struggles. What are those varieties of basil again? Opal, Italian, Tulsi. What's that? And African oh. blue. Italian and what? African blue. African blue. African blue basil. Um, so those are your, your kind of southern six staples. But here, let me add a couple more um, because these are things that I've learned in recent years. Um, there are three types of um, faux spinaches. Um, so there's one called longevity spinach. This purpley one is called Okinawa spinach. So longevity, Okinawa, and there's another one named Malabar. Longevity, Okinawa, and Malabar spinach. And they all love the heat, all three of them. Um, and that's rare for leafy vegetables. It's, um, it's very uncommon to have green leafy vegetables that love the heat, but these three do. Um, the, the first two, Longevity and Okinawa, grow, um, well, I, I'll just show you right here. They grow like this. So do you see it there? That's a whole patch of it. Um, You're a little frozen for- Malabar spin. <laughs> What's that? Your video is frozen for me right now, but I can still uh, hear you. There you how are. How about now? There we go. Yeah. So that's what that um, longevity spinach looks like. So Nathan, when you, you talked about basil earlier, there was the question that came in and apparently um, the sweet basil, there's also a Thai basil that was discussed. And um, Chantel has a basil plant that is roasting. So do you have any recommendations on what she could do to keep it from overheating? It's roasting. Um, is it sweet basil? Did she say? She said yeah, it, is. Yes, it is. It is. Good luck. <laughs> um, just keep it watered and, and let it go through cycles of wet and dry. Um, basil, basil doesn't want to be drowned. It's real sensitive to the soil being too wet. Um, and it also doesn't want to, um, you know, dry out and die. So um, it needs some of those cycles of wet and dry. Um, so it may be. Uh -oh. Looks like we lost him. So we, we lost our speaker temporarily. <laughs> it's, uh, we are in techno technological land, so. <laughs> Hold Let's please. go ahead and get a couple more uh, questions queued up for, for Nathan. Yeah. I'll let him back in when he comes. I'm, I'm back. He's oh, back. There you are. Awesome. Sorry. There you are. Okay, that's even better than the first time. Great, great, oh, great perfect. video. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, so we, we've got those six. We've got those um, basil. Uh, um, oh, so let's talk a couple of other herbs um, that you can we have plant. one question about where to find those three types of spinach that uh, you mentioned. 
Eat your yard jacks. Go see Tim. Great. We'll put that link in the uh, chat as well. Great. Cool. Um, I also, in the summertime, I grow oregano and thyme. Um, both of those take the summer, at least until August when it rains too much. Um, and what am I forgetting? Um, oh, um, this is another variety, a new one to me. I have a, a um, customer here at my, um, my subscription you pick who um, is originally from Jamaica and her mother brought me some seeds and this is Roselle. And you might know Roselle, if you've been to a Caribbean restaurant, there's the like the bright red, almost like natural Kool-Aid um, called Jamaica um, or called Roselle tea. Um, and it's got a bunch of other names too, but it's like just bright, vibrant, um, almost like Hawaiian punch look to it. It's grown from this plant called Roselle. And, and um, they have fruit, red fruit um, uh, that um, are called put those and make wonderful um, punch tea. Um, so Zell is another cool option. Um, yeah. So let's let's jump on to. Um, oh, also, if you want some of those ideas about what you can grow in the summer or year round. Um, if you refer to that, what can you grow in a square resource? That's um, that's your baseline. Yeah, that that's um, definitely an awesome resource. And so let's talk about preventing. Heat. You were you were breaking up when you were talking about Roselle. Um, Chantel also mentioned that it's also sorrel, and I'm very familiar with that. Um, had some sorrel tea or sorrel, yes. uh, Jamaican sorrel. Um, give us an abridged version of what you Absolutely. were saying. We missed almost everything you said. Sure. The, the leaves are delicious fresh. They're lemony. You can eat them in salad. And the, um, the fruit is, um, is bright red, and that's what you make the, um, the tea out of. Thank you. Um, so one, one thing that that what can you grow in a square resource also has is spacing guidelines. Um, and spacing is really important because you need to provide your plants enough space that they they don't waste all their energy just trying to outcompete their neighbor. Um, uh, because when that happens, they they waste all their energy growing stalk and branches, and they don't produce as much fruit. Um, but you want them close enough together that they block out the sunlight at the soil surface, and that way you don't get lots of weeds. Um, so one reason that I really like raised beds is this idea of planting by the square foot. Um, so instead of thinking, oh, well, I'm going to plant a row of this, and then I'm going to come over here and have an open opening to walk down, and then I'm going to plant a row of that, what that leads to is a lot of open soil space. And so because the soil is exposed, then the weeds grow. Whereas if you plant those two rows of crops right next to each other, with another row and another row and another row, right? And you have a solid block of plants, then there's just not a lot of light underneath for weeds to grow. Um, so as an example of this, if you, go, if you go out in a mature forest, there are big trees, right? And then there are some understory plants and then right down at the ground, there are a few little ground covery kind of plants. But it's not like chaos. It's not a jungle. There's not a bunch of vines every which way. But then you go and clear cut that forest. And what happens is you just get this explosion of growth. The blackberries, the kudzu, everything is just growing wild. And that's because there's so much available energy. And so the ecosystem kind of ri um, rises to the, the occasion um, and starts growing because there's open sunshine. So if you plant your garden like that forest, where it's like a solid stand of what you want, then there's not a lot of space underneath for the weeds to, to um, take advantage of. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two about um, weeds is, is just like I said before, getting them when they're early. Um, and the third thing that you can do, and honestly, I don't do this much, but I do use some leaves. Um, especially if I'm going to be traveling for, 
for an extended period of time. If you want to kind of plant your garden and then walk away from it, um, then you can get like a bag of oak leaves and put oak leaves all around your larger plants. And that way it blocks the sunlight from reaching the soil and that way the weeds don't grow. Um, and when I say oak leaves, I'll do four or six inches of, of leaves when I do, um, because that seals in the moisture and it seals the sunlight out. And that way you just don't have all those weeds. Um, that's weeds. And then let's talk, um, let's talk bugs for a second. Um, I'm not gonna go real in, in depth here, um, but I have a great resource. It's called Pesky Pests and What to Do About Them. Um, and the biggest thing, people always say, well, what do you do about bugs? And the answer is nothing. And the answer is everything, right? Okay, so let me break that down. I, I have a, a backyard farm and I have gardens all over town. And um, just like the weeds, I spend so little time managing and trying to kill pests. And a, um, specifically, like I'm not trying to eradicate them, right? But what I do do is I try to make sure my plants are really healthy. I'm endlessly looking at plants and seeing like, well, something about them doesn't look as healthy as they should look, right? And so then I try to remedy that situation. Is it a sunlight issue? Is it a water issue? Is it a fertility and a soil issue, right? Because just like if you watch National Geographic and there's those caribou getting chased by the wolves and they go after the weak, right? The same thing happens in the plant world where um, um, the weak plants are the ones that the pests go after the most. So if you can keep your plants healthy, then you avoid a lot of the pest problems. The other thing about pests on the prevention side is if you grow in season, 90% of your problems with pests go away. You know, if you've got a good site and you're growing things in season, then your plants just aren't so stressed and so they don't attract all these bugs. Like right now, um, right now I said the squash are, are starting to succumb to the heat and the bugs and everything, but they weren't six weeks ago. They look great and they were productive six weeks ago, right? But that was their season. And now it's not their season and so they're stressed and so the bugs move in. Um, so the biggest thing about pests is prevention is plant health. It's just like, you know, it's just like humans, right? Like in your kids, how do you, how do you keep your kids from getting sick is more the answer than what do you do once they get the cold, you know? Um, it's like rest, exercise, good nutrition, same kind of thing for the plants. Um, I will say that on that resource on the back side. Um, I've got listed the five or six most common pests, things like caterpillars, aphids, what have you. Um, and y'all can refer to that for those specific treatments um, if you run into some of those problems. Um, so you got some questions for me? I do, I do. Um, yeah, there was a, a, back, a while back, Kathy mentioned that she's growing some QQ melons for the first time and she wants to know if you have any, ad, any advice for her. So far the plant's getting a little out of control and she's got two to three flowering buds. Mm -hmm. And also, okay. when, when do you plant melons in general while we're on the subject of melons? Yeah, melons are best in the spring. So you'd plant them in like um, uh, March, basically. March is prime time. And that way they can grow and produce by about this time. Um, so um, I would say just uh, keep your, since you already have it growing, then keep it in good shape you could get some um uh, organic fertilizer something like plant tone something that has good um generalized nutrition and i would work in a little bit of that around the, the soil just to give it a little boost um and um uh and then just keep your fingers crossed it doesn't rain too much because the um that whole family the cucurbit family um really doesn't like our intense humidity in all these afternoon thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my uh, melons, all, well, all my squash and zucchini totally bit the dust in the, uh, the you know, great rains of Jacksonville <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, mine too. So, so Nathan, uh, Les is asking too, uh, what's the minimum amount of soil that you would recommend to uh, put vegetables and herbs uh, for a container? Sure. Um, I would want uh, minimum like a 
I guess they're like about a, I think it's a two gallon pot. Um, uh, that's what would feel good to me. You could probably sneak by in a one gallon for some things that were smaller. Um, like you could probably raise um, a little herb or something in a one gallon pot, but I would do a, you know, a two or three gallon pot would be kind of the minimum. Um, in my raised beds, I always do them at least 10 inches deep. So I would look to the same kind of depth with a pot as well. Okay. And um, when you mentioned Eat Your Yard Jacks and you referred us to Tim's website, uh, we were talking about basil and I omitted an answer and I, I'm sorry to Debbie, um, but she wanted to know like, do you, can you get the basil ready to eat? Um, can you buy it so it's ready to eat? Mm-hmm. Same yeah, I mean, sorrel. I think she was talking um, about, yeah, not basil. Is she talking about, can she buy like a plant that's ready to eat or? I'm not sure I understood. Yeah, I think she was talking about, can you buy Brazil anywhere? Um, I've seen it at farmer's markets. Um, you know, for instance, I've seen it at uh, the Riverside um, Arts Market um, several times. So it's just a question of, you know, is it harvested and ready at that time? Yeah. Okay. Um, it sounds like you know more than I do. Well, we're heading to uh, the fall after the, we'll get through this summer, but there's a couple questions that are coming in in reference to um, pumpkins. Uh, is there a kind of type of pumpkin that we can plant here in Jacksonville? And what about Seminole pumpkins as also a vegetable to grow? Yeah. So that's good, good questions. Um, um, contrary to, to the, um, the mythology that surrounds agriculture, we grow pumpkins in spring in Florida. Um, so Seminole pumpkin may be an exception just because it's native um, and it's a little bit, um, it's adapted more to our climate. So you could give that a shot, you know, and try to grow some of those over the summer. Um, but, um, and people do push the season, you know, and try to grow pumpkins and ready in time for Halloween and Thanksgiving. Um, but really the reason that, that um, Thanksgiving is in November is because of Massachusetts, right? Their season, they're planting their spring crops like right now, right? Or maybe four, four weeks ago. And so they're gonna grow throughout the summer and then come the fall, that's when they would harvest all of their bounty. Um, as soon as that, um, as the frost fell, then it would kill back the pumpkin vines and they would harvest the pumpkins. Well, we don't have, you know, frost in, in the fall, right? Where we go out and collect pumpkins. We just have to get them. In fact, if you try to grow them in the summer, mostly what happens is they grow and then just rot on the ground. So when I've grown pumpkins before, I grew them in the, in the spring. And if Thanksgiving had been a Florida phenomenon, we would celebrate Thanksgiving right now in the middle of June. Um, so when, when you're thinking about your agricultural timing, think, Okay, am I thinking about the Puritans of Massachusetts, or am I thinking about you know Florida? Um, it's just a different different context. Mm -hmm. Got a question in reference to um, snakes. So, um, and I'm and I'm not going to try to pronounce the name. Is it pre pre -Ukulin? I'm, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but the question is: She loves gardening and uh, is super scared of snakes. But is there any plants that you would recommend, Nate, that can actually repel a snake? Mm. Um, I don't know of any plants that repel snakes, um, but snakes are, um, um, snakes like hidden spaces. So if you grew things like okra that got up tall and, and kind of didn't have a, any debris near the soil surface, um, or, you know, sunflowers, anything that was kind of tall, then you wouldn't provide them a hiding place. Um, so I could see doing, doing things like that. The roselle is real tall. Um, I might stay away from um, the longevity spinach and Okinawa spinach just because it provides such a kind of like a little jungle um, that they could hide in. Um, and I know this is, is, you know, some people this is just not gonna fly. But so long as you're not dealing with poisonous snakes, those snakes are helping you in the garden because they eat little bugs um, and uh, crickets and, and grasshoppers and things like that. So, you know, 
feel your way forward with that. But I, I know that um, snakes just get people. Um, so if you just don't want anything to do with them, then um, just grow those things. And it's okay to prune your plants so that they're kind of up off the ground, like even tomatoes and things, if you're growing them in the spring, you could prune those lower branches to keep it um, kind of clear cut um, at the soil surface. Okay, thank you. Um, when would you recommend that we plant cucumbers? Cucumbers, spring. Spring, yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and what's the best type of banana that we can plant? What's the best type of banana? Um, that mostly that's a question for Tim, but the finger bananas. So things like ice cream, apple, pineapple, um, Raja Puri. There's, there's several um, of the, like those small, the short little bananas. Uh, they do real well here because bananas take nine months to go from blossom to fruit. And um, the traditional, like the big bananas, they take about two years and it's very rare that we go two full years without a, without a freeze. Um, and if they get hit by that freeze, then it kind of starts over. Awesome. Okay. That's great. Um, so you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, maybe ways to use some of this produce um, in a recipe or two? Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. So um, almost every morning I, um, I eat eggs and toast and greens. Um, and I, um, in the fall and winter, of course, I'm using things like kale and collards. Um, but in the summertime, then I'll use that longevity spinach, um, the Okinawa or Malabar spinach. Um, but actually what I use most are sweet potato greens because my sweet potatoes, they, um, they're a vine. And so they start off kind of in the garden, but then they're trying to go everywhere, right? Like they're jumping and crawling on my sidewalk and things like that. And so what I'll do is I'll just go along with the scissors and trim them back to the edge of my box. And all those greens that are especially large, then, um, then I just chop those up. And um, what I'll do is I'll start with a skillet. Most of my recipes actually start with a skillet. Um, and then I put in some kind of fat, right? What is it, olive oil or butter, bacon grease? It, you know, it depends. I'm, I'm not vegetarian, despite public opinion. Uh, and then goes in the onions and garlic and I kind of brown those. And then uh, I throw in those sweet potato greens. Um, and I actually oftentimes use the lid and I'll throw the lid on. Um, and a recipe I've really been enjoying lately is I use a little bit of um, coconut aminos. I don't do real well with soy. It makes me, um, whatever, doesn't work real well. Uh, but coconut aminos are this kind of sweet, salty flavor that I'll put in there with those greens. And in five minutes they're they're delicious and I'll eat them with my eggs. Um, so that's one thing I like doing during the summer. Um, another uh, thing that, um, that I really enjoy are um, banana peppers. So this is kind of a little cheat. So by and large, the big sweet peppers, you know, bell peppers and such, they do real well in spring and then they'll, the plant continues to grow. But during the heat of summer, they, they get a little bit less productive. And then in the fall, their production kind of goes up. So it's kind of like, like this. Um, but for whatever reason, banana peppers, even though they're a sweet pepper, they, um, they just kick it in the summertime. Um, and so I grow, I end up growing more banana peppers um, than most other kind of peppers. Um, and I use them just like I would a bell pepper because um, a, bell, a banana pepper is actually just a sweet pepper um, but most people encounter banana peppers at Subway or, you know, Publix or whatever in a sub. And those are pickled banana peppers. But you can also just have fresh banana peppers, uh, whether, you know, in a salad um, or um, uh, sauteed in, you know, uh, peppers and onions. Um, oh, goodness. Um, I've been, um, I've got some Tulsi basil that's blooming right now. And I love making fresh teas. So I'll wander around my garden and I'll get a little lemongrass. I'll get a little Tulsi basil. Um, and I actually have some stevia, which is that, you know, the natural herbal sweetener. Um, and I'll just boil some water, put in a few leaves um, and uh, in my, you know, my glass of tea um, and um, wait five minutes. 
and then either you know if it's cool in the morning then i'll have hot tea but in the heat of day i'll just throw some ice in there and make some fresh herb um, um, iced tea it's super delicious that sounds amazing i could go on but um <laughs> you know we, we have a couple questions that are obviously all this food talk has made us ask a, a couple good questions. Um, in reference to the uh, garlic, can we grow garlic here? Is it possible? It is possible. You What you do is you plant it in late fall, like um, late October or November, and it grows all winter long, all spring long, and then somewhere in the late April to May zone is when you would pull it out of the ground. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, Susan Anderson's asking, where do you get most of your seeds outside from eatyouryardjacks.org? Yeah, sure. I get seeds from uh, Standard Feed on Kings Road. I get seeds from um, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get seeds from friends. I get seeds. I order a lot of seeds from Johnny's uh, Select Seeds online. Um, I order seeds from um, Southern Seed Exposure um, and Fedco Seeds. Um, I get them at Ace, but really I, I get seeds everywhere. W when I can, I get organic seeds. Um, and my second priority is supporting local. Um, I get some seeds from um, Cultivate over in Riverside. Um, I go through a lot of seeds. All right, and this is this is a question for me. Um, all this talk of all this produce that do, are you planning like a market pretty soon? Um, do you have a bunch of friends you give all your your fruits and vegetables to? Yeah, good question. Um, I I don't have a market, uh, but I do have um, my backyard farm is a subscription farm, and um, I've got thirty households um, who uh, subscribe just like Netflix. And um, they pay a monthly fee, and then they can come. You pick whatever they want, whenever they want it. Um, and it's, it's actually a model we're looking to try to expand on and, and um, uh, spread around the community. Um, and if you're interested, then what you can do is go to uh, uh, overalls.farm. And I've got a little sign up that says, you know, like, let me know when, when you start a farm in my neighborhood so I can be a member. So if you want to pick and harvest the produce, but you don't really want to grow it, then, um, then let us know that you'd be interested and, and we'll see about uh, if we can get a, a farm started in your neighborhood. I like it. It's great. Cool. I think All that's right. about it. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Do you want to leave us with like a, a word of wisdom um, about uh, this time of year and trying to sure. uh, keep gardens going? Yeah, start small. Um, you can always expand your garden, but if you, if you go too big, then you get overwhelmed and you throw up your hands and you mow it down. Um, so I would always encourage folks to, to start, you know, even with just a little four by four raised bed or some containers um, and, and give it the experiment. And so much of beginning gardening is, um, is giving yourself a little grace, right? Like if you were gonna learn piano, you wouldn't expect that in two months time you could you know play full beethoven concertos right but we have this idea that like when we garden we should be able to like instantaneously have the best garden in the neighborhood um and so just give yourself some grace realize that it's a learning process just like any other um skill set that you develop and um and know that i've killed more plants than all of y'all put together um so <laughs> So, um, yeah, and have fun, you know, enjoy it. Watch those plants grow. It's really um, magic. Thank you. That's great advice. And um, I certainly uh, can feel you because I started off very small with uh, just pots in my backyard and then added some more and added some more and added some more and then added some raised beds. Uh, I still don't know what I'm doing though. So, um, <laughs> But uh, I, I know more and more about after meeting people like you. Um, I want to thank Nathan Ballantyne, Man and Overalls, for giving us this fantastic wealth of knowledge that he's spent a lifetime accumulating. Thank you, Nate. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Um, while I have you all here, I want to give you um, a little update on uh, some other programs that we have doing, um, that we're uh, getting ready to present. Uh, next week, same, same, uh, uh, same time, 6 p.m. June 30th, we have a different kind of landscaping with Shawana Brooks and Roosevelt Watson III, who have come up with an ingenious way to landscape their yard using public art. So uh, register for that. And just going to add that link into the chat so you can click on it and register right now. I also want to tell you about this Gardening for Pollinators program that UF IFAS Extension has put together. It is a uh, self guided um, program that, pardon me, uh, may, you may want to mute yourself right now. Uh, uh, gardening for Pollinators, that um, it's a self-guided uh, program that uh, is just $15. You can register through August 15th and um, it includes um, a lot of different instructors, including the Clay County Horticultural Extension Agent, Wayne Hobbs, who I think is familiar to many people on this program. Um, and Damien is going to add that link to the chat. Also, I wanted to, while I have a captive audience, um, suggest that maybe if you're not a member of the Garden Club, that this is a good time to become a member. We can't do programs like this without the support of our members. And uh, your membership will not only give you access to all sorts of cool opportunities in the future, back when we are uh, meeting in person again, but also We'll be doing some virtual programs that will also uh, be free or very low cost for members. And so it's a good opportunity for you to get in on that on the ground floor and you'll be supporting the Garden Club of Jacksonville at the same time. And Davian will add a link to that as well. We have a survey for today's program that we would love for you to take. Uh, your surveys help us shape our future programs and let us know um, what works for you so if you could check that out, uh, Damien is going to add that link to the chat as well, and we will send that out to all of the participants afterward as well. Okay, well, um, I wanted to thank Jesse Ball DuPont Fund once again for making programs like this possible. We're so grateful to them. And I wanna say thank you to you, Damien, my partner in crime for uh, doing this with me. Yeah, you're welcome. It's the pleasure week after week. I'm loving it. Yeah. And we want to thank all of you for attending and uh, knowing that we just can't do these things without you because otherwise we'd be talking to ourselves. So <laughs> um, I wish I could see you all in person right now. Um, but if I can't, this is the next best thing. So thank you guys for coming and we will see you next time, June 30th. Goodbye.